Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome into our study. Hope you're well. Hope you're not too busy or stressed out because it's two days before Christmas. Uh, with our relative lack of activity this year, maybe that's one benefit. We're not quite as stressed and harried and so forth as normal, but uh, anyway, it's good to have a few minutes to study together. We're continuing our study in the book of James, just sort of working our way through the book, not covering every single verse, but um, getting a pretty good flavor of, of what we find, the wisdom that's found in James. I wanted to show you uh, tonight that that I'm in the spirit show you. I've even got a Christmas tree in my office here. You see my little uh, Charlie Brown Christmas tree? Just to show you, I'm not a Scrooge. <clears throat> and I can celebrate too. But uh, we're glad to have a few minutes together. We're going to be in part of the fourth chapter of James and part of the fifth chapter tonight. We're going to pick up about verse 11 of chapter 4 and work through the end of that chapter into chapter 5, talking this evening about uh, ways people insult God. And we certainly wouldn't want to be a part of that. But there was a preacher one time who gave sort of an unusual sermon. We do that sometimes. Um, he, he did an object lesson where he used a peanut um, to make several points about the wisdom of God in nature. And afterwards, one of the members greeted him at the door and said, very interesting sermon, preacher. I never expected to learn so much from a nut. Well, that was pretty clever. And uh, and funny. Sometimes insults can be fun. They can be all fun. Um, we have to be careful with that. But sometimes they can be fun. Of course, sometimes insults are a lot more serious. Uh, and imagine the, the possibility of insulting God. I can't fathom anybody ever wanting to do that, whether accidentally or on purpose, but it can be done. And, and uh, in this passage from James, it runs again through the end of chapter 4 and the beginning of chapter 5. James writes about some ways that people can, can really insult God. And I just want to work down through them with you in our study tonight. Um, all of the ways that James suggests that people insult God come really from an assault on God's sovereignty. And, and what I mean is this, that you know, a person insults God when they reject God's authority, uh, when they put themselves in God's place, or when they try to remove God from his throne and place themselves upon it. And... Uh, each of the three insults that uh, we'll refer to in this passage are really different examples of assaulting the sovereignty of God. Uh, so let's look and see how this works. Uh, begin in verse 11 of chapter 4, where it's written, Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? So one way that, that people insult God is by speaking evil against one another. Um, and, you know, at first blush, that might sound strange. How, how is it that I insult God by speaking against another person? 
Well, remember that these are all assaults on God's sovereignty. They are challenges to God's authority. So how is speaking evil against another person a challenge or an insult to God? Well, James explains it in sort of legal terms, we might say. He talks about the law and a judge. And, and here is uh, where it's really important to remember what we've studied previously in James and some other lessons. Now, when he refers to the law, what law is James referring to? If you look back to chapter 2 of this book, <clears throat> in particular verse 8, James writes there, If you really fulfill the royal law according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. So mostly when James talks about law, um, that's what he's referring to, the royal law, uh, the law of love. It's royal because it's from the king. The king, of course, is Jesus. Jesus commanded love. Uh, first to God, then also uh, um, to neighbor, to brother and sister. And so when you speak evil of someone, you're not loving them. And that, in turn, is an offense against God. Uh, God made each one of us in his image. And if we are Christians, he has remade each of us into the image of his son. And so if we speak evil against one another, uh, what is it that we say to God? We say, God, get out of my way. You don't know what you're doing. This person is a fool. They are worthless. They're not worthy of respect and mercy and kindness. So, you know, when we speak evil against someone, we make ourselves, as James says, judges of them. But James says there's only one judge. Uh, there's only one lawgiver, and it's not us. Now, there are all kinds of ways I suppose we could speak evil against one another. A, a person can gossip. Um, they can slander. They can hurl insults. They can mock. They can make fun of in a cruel way, in an unkind way. But all of them really insult God, ultimately. And that's what James is, is striving to get us to see here. So that's the first way that, um, that we can insult God, is sort of by insulting others. A second way that people insult God is that they presume upon God's future. Um, this really comes in the rest of this chapter. If you look beginning in verse 13, it says, now, <clears throat> come now you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. So this is uh, our, our second example here of an insult of God. And you know, James explains this particular way um, of challenging God's sovereignty, his authority. And it's sort of the idea of planning one's future without including God, without considering God. You see, the future really belongs to God, not to us. God is already there. He's waiting on us. And so it's his future, and we have to respect that as his creatures and, and not presume upon it. Um, now, it's not a sin to lay out plans and to think and to strategize and to plan ahead. This isn't saying that that is wrong. In fact, we could really cite a lot of scripture to support the idea that we need the plan and we need to prepare. You know, Jesus talked, for instance, about 
um, counting the cost. That's, that's looking to the future, considering things. The problem comes when we don't submit our plans to God's will. Uh, the problem comes when we prepare without prayer. So James says in this, in this text that our life is like a mist. And that is intended to humble us, folks. You know, it's not uh, necessarily a compliment. It's, it's a humbling thing. Our life is like a mist. Um, if you think about a mist, it doesn't, it doesn't um, leave a lasting impression, does it? Uh, you know, we I was thinking about this. We hear about people talking about, oh, the great earthquake of such and such a year, the, the great earthquake of 1912 or, or the great flood of 1937 or here we are in winter and you hear people talk about the, the, the blizzard of 76, you know, things that really made an impression. You ever hear anybody say, yeah, you remember the great mist of 97? No, a mist, it just appears for a little while and vanishes away. And James compares that to us. He compares it to our life. Um, and he's not writing that to, to um, offend us or insult us or belittle us. Uh, because remember, we are made in the image of God and his son um, died for us on the cross. But it is here to keep us humble if we need to be humbled. And sometimes and maybe oftentimes we do. You know, when I think about tomorrow, I, I need to think about God. When I plan out my week, I need to realize who really owns my week. Uh, when I envision things five years out or 10 years out, whatever it might be, that is a process that I need to bathe in prayer. And my attitude needs to be, this will happen if God wills it. Um, and to be genuine <clears throat> and honest about that. Now, does that mean that every time I speak about what I plan to do tomorrow or even in the next hour or whatever, that I need to repeat this phrase, Lord willing. Um, I've heard some say that, that you need to do that. And I don't really believe that uh, that's necessary. Nothing wrong with saying Lord willing, as long as it's not a, a vain repetition. But the important thing is having that attitude of Lord willing in our heart as we think about things, as we make plans. Um, then I was thinking about this 17th verse, the last one we read there that closes the chapter. If I had a quarter for every time I've heard preachers quote that verse down through the years, you know, therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it is sin. I can even quote it in the old KJV language because I heard it so often. And I heard it used for everything, you know. But look at it in context. What's the context in which it's spoken Jane, or written? James is talking about planning the future when he says that and making sure that we keep God at the center of our future. Now, we know we ought to do that. And to not do that is really to insult God. And it's another way that we can insult our creator. Well, in our section here, the final uh, example comes at the beginning of chapter 5. And it's interesting, here at the beginning of chapter 5, we have some of the strongest language in the entire letter used. Chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. It's, it's addressed to the rich, to the wealthy. And you wonder, is James writing to, to wealthy Christians? Or is he sort of writing to the rich that are out there in, in the community that he was writing to? I, I sort of lean toward the latter, although um, maybe there were some wealthy members of the Christian community at the time. We're, we're just not sure, but it's really strong language uh, written to the rich here. And just... Uh, 
to, to sort of hear what it sounds like. Chapter 5, verse 1. He says, Come now, you rich. Weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Really, strong condemn, condemnation um, in that paragraph. And if you think about the context, you know, the rich in James's day were very few. Uh, they were few and far between, but they had a lot of power over the rest of the people. Most everybody was poor. Uh, there, I think we mentioned this before. There was no middle class in the ancient world. You had a very few rich, and then everybody was poor and struggling. And James says, in, I think a very powerful way here, that those who hoard wealth, uh, you heard there, they, they own fields and they're not paying the, the wages. Due. He says those who hoard wealth um, and, and those who cheat others out of what's rightfully theirs and just indulge themselves in riches and wealth while people all around them are in need and, and are suffering, he says there is going to be a great reversal in eternity of that situation. <clears throat> and so we think about what's the insult of God here. Uh, this kind of behavior is, is an insult against the Creator. And the insult is that by hoarding wealth, one is really challenging the fact that it all belongs to God anyway. See, it's really His, and He's loaned it to us. It's just another assault on God's sovereignty. It's, it's saying either, I don't trust God to take care of me, or it's saying, I don't need God. Look at everything I have. I'm doing just fine without Him. Either way, that's an insult to God. I want to illustrate it with a true story that I read. Uh, there was a lady, an American lady named Hetty Green. She died in 1916, a long time ago, before the Spanish flu uh, hit our country. She died in 1916. At the time, she was known as the Witch of Wall Street. When she died, she was considered the richest woman in the world. She had amassed a fortune of $100 million. Now, that's a lot of money even now, but think about how much it was at that time. Uh, unheard of. And so she was a true tycoon in uh, the early uh, 1900s. She had more money than she could ever spend in several lifetimes. But the story is about how she actually lived her life. Listen to the, these facts about Hetty Green, the richest lady in the first half of the 1900s. She divorced her husband because he spent too much. She sent her daughter to live in a convent for a spiritual reason, no. It said she sent her to live in a con convent because the nuns would pay her expenses. This woman who had everything. When her nine-year-old son, Edward, was injured in a wagon accident, she would only take him to free clinics, though she had enough to send him to any doctor, any hospital in the entire world. She would only send him to free, free clinics, and because of the lousy uh, care he received 
in those places. His leg wound just got worse and worse. Eventually, it had to be amputated. Um, easily could have been avoided with better care. Hetty's diet consisted mainly of dry oatmeal, onions, and cold eggs because she would not pay for fuel to heat her food. This is the woman that had $100 million in the early 1900s. She lived in an unheated tenement in Manhattan. She wore the same dress for years. And it said that uh, during all those years, it faded from a rich black color to a dull brown, but she never wore anything else. She died worth millions and millions of dollars, but you know what? She was completely alone. Why? Well, her, her life insulted God. She hoarded wealth. She mistreated others. She lived totally without faith. But, um, but all of these ways that we've noticed uh, insult the Creator um, by challenging His authority and by attempting to, to take Him off His throne, assaulting His sovereignty. That's really the basis of this. And the opposite of each one of those is, of course, how we actually want to live. How you could teach this lesson in the opposite way and just sort of turn each of these around and that's the way we want to live. You know, we want, for instance, to speak blessing into people's lives uh, instead of insulting and cursing. Uh, we want to speak blessing into people's lives. We want to acknowledge the future as belonging to God and pray that his will will be done in all things, just like Jesus did. Thy will be done in his great prayer, his model prayer. And then we want to be generous and, and fair and humble with whatever wealth God gives us. And so instead of insulting God, uh, living in these ways, our lives will be a blessing to God and a blessing to others. So it's it's sort of the nature of James writing, you know, uh, these wisdom writings that we find in James uh, to talk about things like this in sort of a, a series, I guess you might say, around a theme, uh, three ways of insulting God, or turn them around, do the opposite, three ways of blessing God. So, again, I hope it's a, a, a challenge to you to think about these and sort of compare our lives to the mirror that James holds up before us of God's Word here. Again, I hope you have a, a great Christmas and great rest of the week. Um, I think we're going to have some exciting things happen when we assemble together in a few days on the Lord's Day. So we're looking forward to that and and uh, just encourage you uh, to bless someone in the time you have this week. Uh, let's pray and then we'll conclude. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love. Most of all, thank you for your, the example of your Son who lived these things out before us, showed us the way and help us to major in understanding his life and his example and then living it out in our world. Pray your blessings on our world that will come through this <clears throat> season of challenge and fear and anxiety that will come out the other side uh, to a new day. Thank you for Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen.